Uh, Russell, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, I will be pretty brief. Uh, the cardiovascular component of the BRC has the benefit of nine years of cardiovascular BIU. So in a way, we had the opportunity to create an infrastructure and not least understand how the NIHR work. Now, in cardiac surgery, mortality is not a problem any longer. Hardly anybody died. In fact, I can tell you that the last published results from the Bristol Heart Institute for the last three years, over 4,000 operations, the survival was 98.5. So if you play the lottery with these odds, you win every week. The same is very much for the, for the pediatric. But the real problem in heart surgery, adult and pediatric, remain morbidity. And for that, I mean that maybe 30 or 40 percent of patients will experience a complication like acute kidney failure, chest infection, bleeding, or sepsis. And this is where we want to concentrate. One, perhaps the most ambitious part of this plan, is to try to consent every patient going through the unit, adult and pediatric and to create a database which will have clinical information, but also which will collect blood sample, urine sample, and when is possible tissues. And working with the, what I like to call the clever people, uh, who are part of the cross-cutting team of the BRC, we will use genomic to understand or to predict to a certain extent which patient may run into trouble and if we can do that, although we may not be able to predict them going into trouble, we'll be able to intervene at a much earlier stage. The other important part of our plan is to raise the next generation of basic scientists and clinicians, because my generation, who has been leading on this, not just me, many other people, are getting a bit long on the tooth, so we had to find new people will take over from us. And I think the next speaker, Ben, is an example of what we're trying to achieve. Ben is, is at present a, an NHS cardiac surgical anesthetist who suddenly, not suddenly, who has discovered that he's got a very deep interest in academia. And we, we really encourage him to pursue this. And as you will see, his work has been very important because he's managed to get together surgeon, anesthetist, endocrinologist, IT people. So it's a clear example of where we aim in and where we want to go in the next few years. So I won't say anything else, and I'll leave it to Ben to explain you what is done. Thank you. Just to move forward. So I'm going to talk about um, rhythms of stress hormones after heart surgery and in the critically ill. And uh, when we get the trainees coming through, trainee anaesthetists and surgeons, we try and teach them that uh, heart surgery is like hitting your thumb with a hammer, in that uh, it gets red and it gets swollen. And when you hit your thumb with a hammer, it gets red because the blood vessels get bigger, and it gets swollen because all the fluid leaks out of the blood vessels and into the tissues. So that means you have a situation where people have low blood pressure because they have big, baggy blood vessels, and they've got no fluid in them. So we wind up putting them on drugs like noradrenaline to make their blood vessels smaller, and we give them loads and loads of fluid uh, to try and counteract that low blood pressure. And rather like if you sprain your ankle or you whack your thumb with a hammer, it swells up the night of the surgery, lasts two to three days, and then gets better again. But one of the things that protects you against inflammatory things, and rather like if you have a swollen ankle, you might have a steroid injection. Now, we produce our own steroids as anti-inflammatories. And what uh, one of the things that I've tried to do is understand the way that these are produced and how that might, the way that we give them back to patients, which sometimes we do, whether we're doing that in the right way and whether that's a phys there's a physiological underpinning of that. So a bit of... Uh, medical school or nursing school or undergraduate physiology um, is the HPA axis. So your steroids are produced by the hypothalamic pituitary and adrenal axis. So your hypothalamus in your brain kicks out corticotrophin-releasing hormone, 
goes to your pituitary, and then your pituitary releases ACTH that then goes to your adrenal glands, of which the final end pathway is kicking out cortisol, the stress hormone, or which is a steroid hormone. And I think loads of people know that steroids are secreted in a circadian rhythm, which means they're high first thing in the morning, which is why we all feel quite awake, and they're low in the late afternoon and early evening, which is why we all feel a bit sleepy at about four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but actually, this is what a circadian rhythm looks like. But actually, if you measure that really closely, and you take those blood samples every 10 minutes rather than just four hours like this is, then you discover that it's pulsatile. So those highs are produced by large amplitude frequency pulses, and the lows are produced by virtually no pulsatility at all. And it's not just cortisol, it's your ACTH as well. So, and the ACTH pushes up your cortisol, uh, which brings down, uh, which then reduces the secretion of ACTH. So you can see that the red line is ACTH, and that precedes cortisol. And I try and explain it, that it looks, it's like a Newton's cradle in that there's a negative feedback oscillator here, which means that, the, as I said, the ACTH pushes up the cortisol, cortisol feeds back and knocks back the ACTH. Now, originally it thought that this was a pulse generator doing this, but work by Stafford Lightman's group in the Dorothy Hodgkin building has shown that, in fact, it only happens in this Goldilocks blue zone there of relatively high adrenal delay and relatively high CRH drive. And actually, if you're outside of those parameters, you don't get pulsatility. And I'll show you later on uh, a patient who is outside those parameters and they don't have pulsatility. Now, people say, well, you know, that's all very nice, but what does that pulsatility mean? Well, your genetic output tracks those cortisol pulses. So cortisol is like a transcription factor, which is a transcription factor effectively. And what you find is that different genes pulse in time with those cortisol pulses. And you, no, you don't just get different amounts of genes, you get fundamentally different genes produced, whether you have a pulsatile or a continuous uh, activation of those receptors. And it's really important in the real world as well, because people who have Addison's disease that um, don't produce their own cortisol. And even when they're perfectly replaced, i.e. you give them tablets so they're optimally replaced with their cortisol, actually if they don't have pulsatility, they're twice as likely to die as their peers. And work with or Professor Lightman's group have a big randomized clinical trial trying to recreate those pulses in people with Addison's and look at their outcomes. Because actually it's not they get more infections, they get tired, they're mentally slow. But I'm really interested in surgery, and I think beforehand, people have always tried to bump all of uh, surgery and critical illness and the inflammatory response into one big thing, but actually it's not. It's, it's the people who are critically ill still on day 14 after their surgery or day 14 on the intensive care unit are different to those on day one. So we tried to split it up a bit and look at it segmentally. Now, part of the thing is that people had always known that cortisol went up after surgery. And this is work from 20 years ago showing that uh, what happened was your cortisol goes up, your ACT goes down on, you know, goes up on the day of surgery and then comes down. Uh, and that's it. And everyone, and still when I put in grant applications, people go, yeah, 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 well, we know what happens because this happens. And uh, they'd always said, yeah, there's a disconnect between cortisol and your ACTH. They're not con connected. You're... Uh, it's just, you know, there must be something else doing it, but your cortisol goes high. And in fact, using some of my work, in fact, we show that across a population, that is what happens. Because if you aggregate data, you get beautiful, smooth lines. So this is all, pa this is 20 patients having heart surgery at the Bristol Heart Institute, having coronary artery surgery, and we measured their cortisol every 10 minutes, and it looks like this, and it's a beautiful, smooth line. And so when me and my colleagues make decisions about uh, tests we're going to do, and the models in our head, we use aggregated data like this to think about the individual person in front of us. But actually, that's not what happens when you look at the individual. When you look at the individual, it's pulsatile after heart surgery. And this is one patient uh, having off-pump coronary artery surgery. So, in fact, Professor Angelini operated on this uh, character. And the, the sort of first quarter of it is during the operation. Uh, and what you can see is that the ACTH drives the cortisol up after the operation. Um, and then it falls back down again. 
but there's still interaction between the two. So there's no disconnect at all. Your pituitary is still interacting with your adrenal gland. It's just that the sensitivity of your adrenal gland is much higher. And so the gain's been turned up on the system. And these levels are much higher. But if you looked across all of the patients, what you could see is that actually they, they, the adrenal glands became much more sensitive about four to six hours after surgery and then went back to normal by about a day again. But there was still that interaction there. There was no disconnect at all. And using a reverse translation model with the Dorothy Hodgkin building, we, we came up with a molecular mechanism for this, which is that effectively this was all new cortisol. And it wasn't that... It wasn't anything else about sort of ACTH. It was about the sensitivity of the system, and it was an increase in the ACTH receptor accessory protein that, was, uh, that made your adrenal gland much more sensitive to steroids. So it's all very nice if you do that in people having straightforward heart surgery, but actually, as the professor says, you know, most people get through heart surgery relatively unscathed, and you're safer having heart surgery than you are having gut surgery now. Um, so what happens when you're critically ill? Because they're the people we're really interested in. So again, we looked at 24-hour cortisol and ACTH profiles of people who didn't get better after heart surgery. So we're still on intensive care. That means that they were needing organ support. They were on a ventilator. They were still on those powerful drugs. They were on kidney machines. Um, and what we found was that they're still pulsatile as well. Uh, and that pulsatility and interaction still exists. And the reason why this is important is that my colleagues uh, across the world and across the country do blood tests looking for cortisol because uh, they think you may or may not produce enough of it. And so they just take one blood sample. And when they take one blood sample, I don't know where you are on this pulse line. And you don't know where they are two hours later. And they make up an arbitrary number and then say, right, well, we'll give you steroids then because you're not producing enough. And so we've showed that actually everybody's still pulsatile. So taking point measures of cortisol doesn't tell you anything about their steroid axis. And what was very sad for the patient, but very interesting for us, was a critically ill patient that died at the end of the 24-hour period sampling. So this person died where the red line goes down, and they, they still had 10-minute blood sampling of their cortisol and ACTH. And what you can see is that actually they lose their pulsatility, they lose their variability, and it drives outside of that interactive range, the Goldilocks zone that I was telling you about earlier. And so what's really interesting from my point of view for this is that actually this happened before the clinicians recognised that this person was sick. The, pe the clinicians recognised the person was sick about halfway along this chart. So actually, we, could we use this as an early warning system? So what are the implications of this? Well, the first one, as I was telling you about, is that actually we do blood tests to see whether people are producing enough steroids. And what some of my colleagues do is they just take a blood test and send it off to the lab, and then they get a number back, and they say, right, well, um, you're deficient or that's all right. But actually working, using our data and working with the statistics department with Pro Professor Nassen's group, we could show that actually that, that didn't hold true, and that actually a blood sample of cortisol, any point level, doesn't tell you anything about what that level is going to be even 40 minutes later. So actually those point cortisol values, there is no point to doing them. And then interestingly, when you put all those patterns together, they tell you quite a lot about the patients. And so actually can we use these levels to, to look at uh, as early warning systems and whether these people are normal, are, are behaving normally or not. So you can see the normal healthy adult looks different to someone having routine straightforward surgery, looks different to a critically ill person that survives compared to someone that dies. And so in our ongoing work, we're translating it to children. So we've done it in adults, but you can't take blood samples from children because you can't take all of these, you know, we're taking 10 minute blood samples uh, for 24 hours, and that actually turns out to be a reasonable amount of blood. So again, with Professor Lightman's group, we are using microdialysis to actually get tissue, blood, tissue samples uh, of cortisol every 20 minutes. And so this is the, we've done, a, we've done the first sort of 10, 15 of these patients now. And sometimes people say, oh, we know what happens, and we don't know, um, we don't need to know any more. And I would argue that actually, if you don't 
want to know what's happening with these children having heart surgery and what's happening to their stress and anti-inflammatory hormones, then this is really important. And it doesn't matter. This is, to me, this is the most important slide of this whole talk. I can put up graphs and anything else in data. But this, this I still find very affecting because I have a one-and-a-half-year-old child as well, and it reminds me of that. And so that's why our research is so important, is to understand these children and what's happening to their stress hormones. But we use a microdialysis catheter that just slips under the skin to take these samples every 10 minutes of tissue so we don't take any blood. Um, and then we look at the values. And we've got the first ones back last week. And this is what happens to babies having heart surgery, to a single baby having heart surgery, eight months old, having their uh, atrioventricular valves repaired. And you can see that it goes up. And I, without going into any more than this, there's some very interesting things about the way we understand uh, salt and water retention with this and how that system's activated. And because actually it's quite time consuming taking blood samples and it's quite time consuming, uh, we actually analyze all those samples offline. So we take all the microdialysis samples and send them to Groningen to do LCMS on. Actually what we want to do is develop a continuous cortisol monitor. And we're beginning to do that. We're just putting in a grant with a team from Imperial College and the preliminary data using Aptimus. So we have online continuous readout of cortisol that's coming out of the microdialysis system. And we try and translate this into clinical, clinically relevant work as well. So again, uh, we did some work with Julian Higgins and Jose Lopez last year looking at uh, different patterns of steroid delivery in people on the intensive care unit um, and looking at their 28-day mortality, which actually it probably didn't affect, but it did affect their shock reversal as to whether they were uh, more or less likely for their blood pressure to get better or not. And so I've got a few thanks of all these various people that have helped. This is a team effort, and this is by no means exhaustive. We've got some of the research nurses here who've stood and taken those blood samples every 10 minutes for 24 hours. Uh, and so this is not an exhaustive list, but thank you very much. Thank you.